All right, now our um, excuse me, that's not the right button. All right, sorry about that. Deuteronomy chapter seven. We're gonna look at we're gonna look at something tonight. Um, we're gonna get into some attributes of God that a lot of people you know it's not probably not much time spent on these attributes, and um, it it might not be preached very frequently in a lot of churches these days. But they're very important attributes. Now, everyone knows about God's love and His mercy and His long-suffering. And all of those attributes, those great, those positive attributes, they deserve a lot of attention. They deserve a lot of preaching. They deserve, you know, because, because it's good news. I mean, it's, it's great news. We need to know. We, we learned that a little bit this morning when we we're going through the fasting, that, that when we fast and pray unto God, God is merciful. God is long-suffering. And that's one of the reasons why we need to continue to just go back to Him. And, and when we get in sin, just repent and, and, and turn back to God and, and entreat Him because we know that He's a merciful and long-suffering God. But I want to point out a phrase here that we saw in Deuteronomy chapter number 6. Seven, because some people you read this and I remember the first time that I read I read something like this from the Bible while well, a much younger Christian I didn't really know any better it just it kind of strikes you as weird look at verse number 21 it says thou shalt not be affrighted at them for the Lord thy God is among you a mighty God and terrible right there the Bible says that God is terrible and that's the title of my sermon today God is terrible now these days we think about that you hear that God is terrible and you and we automatically associate like terrible means bad, right? I mean, it's kind of how we use the word. Like something bad happens to someone and be like, oh man, that's terrible. And, and it's not something you wish upon someone else or, you know, it's, it's, it's a slightly different meaning, but really it, it's not all that different because the word terrible, it comes from the word terror, mm -hmm. right? God instills terror in people and we get so, sometimes we get so focused on the love of God, which is great, and that's the good news. You know, and when we go out and preach the gospel, and when we're preaching Jesus Christ, we're preaching a good message. Obviously, though, you have to be able to preach the, the bad news, too. I mean, it starts off preaching about the terror of God. It, you know, people should be terrified of hell. Hell is a real place, my friends. Hell exists in the center of this earth right now, and there are souls that are burning and being tortured and tormented in hell right now. And that is a terrible place. That, is, that would be a terrifying place for anybody to go and to spend an eternity. And, 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 and that is the bad news. And when we go out, we, we talk to people, you know, they need to be informed about that. They need to know that that's real because that is the judgment for our sins. That is the punishment that we deserve. And that is what Jesus saves us from. But that's not what we spend the majority of our time on. You know, I mean, usually people can get that concept and understand, hey, look, I know I've done wrong. And the Bible says that it's God's punishment. So we, we tend to spend a lot more time on the good news, on the gospel, on the saving aspect and all that. But we can't ignore the bad news. We can't just skip all of the bad news and just go straight to the good news. We have to teach both. People have to understand both. So that's kind of one of the points of, of the sermon tonight. It's not going to be the, the most uplifting sermon, but we need to understand all of the attributes of God. We want to get to know God, and we're going to get to know God from His Word. So we're going to look at a lot of Scripture tonight. We're going to go through the Bible and see different places. where We're, we're starting with, with terrible. I'm going to go into a couple other attributes as well that don't get touched on very often. But it's important to get the full picture of who God is. I mean, the Bible says that God is love, and that is absolutely true. I believe that as long as, it, you know, as much as a day is long. God is love. The Bible says that it's absolutely true. But that's not all he is. There, there are other aspects of God. God has wrath. God's the one who created hell. God's the one who gave us judgments and commandments and he gave us these things to live by. So we want to try to get a, a full, complete picture of God. And we see here in this, first, in this first chapter here that we read in Deuteronomy 7 that he says, the, for the Lord thy God is among you, a mighty God and terrible. Now we're going to see when we look at some of these other references to God being terrible, it's very much associated with his might and with his power. And you think about being stuck in, maybe you're outside during an extremely bad storm, whether it be um, 
a tornado or a hurricane. I don't know if any of you have ever been around that. You know, growing up in Illinois, was, I've never really been actually in a tornado, but been like close enough and seeing that stuff. That can be a very terrifying experience because you are all of a sudden, especially if you're like not inside and not in some shelter, not in some level of safety, when you actually kind of experience what I like to call the power of God, you know, the power of, of, of the way he's able to manipulate the weather and these things, it's a very humbling experience. You get very terrified, and, and that's, those are the moments when atheists are calling on God, right? When, 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 you're, when you're stuck in the middle of nowhere and you, 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 know, like, you can't do anything. You're not very proud anymore. You're not all of a sudden thinking like, oh man, I could get out of this and, and I'm so tough and, and you have this big attitude. No. You get shipwrecked and you're in the middle of the ocean and you got the waves cragging around you and you've got all these forces against you and it starts to rain and pour and stuff. You're not going to be thinking you're such a tough guy anymore. You're going to be calling out to God. But that's the, that's the type of thing. See, that, those types of situations can instill terror. And God's presence alone and just his power. God is so powerful. He was able to speak everything into existence. God said, let there be light. And there was light. That is how much power he has. He doesn't even have to lift a finger and it's done. And being in the presence of, some, of a being, of an entity so powerful... For us, it would be terrifying because he could extinguish your life like that. I mean, you could, you, you're just like, I don't want you to look at me wrong, God. You know, I, I don't want you to do anything. If we were to be confronted with him face to face. Now, again, there's so much to be said about, about God's love and his mercy and everything. And that's great. I don't want to just completely forget about that because, because it exists and it's real. But we're not focusing on that tonight. We're focusing just a little bit more on, on the negative aspects and, and on the fact that the Bible calls God terrible. And, and we just got to make sure we have the, the right definition of terrible. It's just some, it means he's able to instill terror. And it's usually just because of his power. But when he says he's terrible, and you know, today we talk about um, terrorists, right? Terrorists are all over the news because they're, they're, what are they doing? They're instilling fear in people. So the terrorists use um, big events to try to make a big show to get people scared. So that's why they do bombings on airplanes and things like this because it may, it, it's widely seen and it gets a lot of attention and the whole goal is to get people afraid of them. Afraid like, oh man, I don't want to go on an airplane now because maybe I'll get blown up. So that's, that's a tactic that they use, but they're instilling terror in other people. That's why they're called terrorists. So in a way, <laughs> You could say, and, and you know, with no disrespect to God, but God can be called a terrorist because he does instill terror into people. But he does it righteously, right? I mean, he's not, he's not doing it um, arbitrarily or for some fleshly goal of, of you know, whatever the, the terrorists are out to do. He, he does it for, for his purposes, which are legitimate. Now, you're in Deuteronomy 7. Just flip over one, one page or one chapter to, to chapter 8. And we're going to see here, it's not, it's not a reference to God being terrible, but in verse 15, it says, Who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint. And I just, it's just to help with our understanding and definition of terrible. It's calling the wilderness terrible. Why is the wilderness terrible? Well, because there were fiery serpents, there's scorpions, there's drought. It's dangerous. It's very difficult. There's all these, these things that can hurt you and can cause you harm and inflict harm upon you. That's why it's terrible. Well, that's the same reason why, why God is referred to as terrible, because he can inflict all kinds of, of punishment, all kinds of hurt upon, upon people. He brings evil upon people. Now, it says, now, evil, again, it's not necessarily bad. It just means it's inflicting harm upon somebody. That's a, a biblical definition of the word evil means just to bring harm. You're harming someone. So, like, for example, we have the, you know, I don't even know if we have the death penalty anymore because hardly anyone's ever put to death. But let's say it still is being practiced. The person who is the executioner and in a just setting, right, that person that puts the other person to death, they bring evil upon that person. It doesn't mean they're doing bad necessarily. It just means they're bringing, they're bringing harm to that person. They're, they're inflicting harm. So when you see that God, in the Bible, you'll see, you'll see verses that say that God does evil to someone. He does evil because it's, it's, it's inflicting punishment. When, when God brought his judgment against these nations, he brought evil upon those nations. When the children of Israel cast them out and he said, utterly destroy them, don't pity them. Look, they've, they've strayed so far. They did all these horrible, bizarre things you read about in Leviticus. And, and, and they've strayed so far away with their strange gods and their perversions and all the stuff that they were doing. He says, don't pity them. 
But that, that judgment of them being, being destroyed and, and cast out, that was evil brought upon them. Um, Deuteronomy, you're in chapter 8. Look, flip over to verse, uh, chapter number 10. We're going to see, we're gonna see a couple reference here to God being called terrible. Just, just, um, Deuteronomy 10, 16. The Bible says, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty. Look at there's that word again, being mighty. And a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. He doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and widow, and loveth the stranger in giving him food and raiment. So here we see, you know, both aspects of God. He's, he's mighty, he's terrible, he incites terror, but he's also, uh, you know, loveth the stranger and gives him food, and God is, you know, God is good. He's not, he's not all one or the other, but we need to understand both. I'll just read from you for you. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 47. We're going to spend a little bit of time in the Psalms as well. Nehemiah 1.5 says, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. And then in Nehemiah 9.32, the Bible reads, Now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, and the terrible God, who keep his covenant and mercy. And it goes on and on. And again, we see there the fact that he's mighty with being terrible. The fact that God is all-powerful, and we're going to see that in, in just a minute, um, why that's that's so terrible to be, that God's so mighty. But in Psalm 47, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, O clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. See, it goes into him being terrible with him being able to subdue. That's a great power to be able to subdue the, the people under us and the nations under our feet. He has the power to go out and do those things. He has the power to protect. He has the power to defeat these great nations. Psalm, uh, turn if you would to Psalm 66. Psalm 66. And we're going to start reading verse number 3. The Bible says, Say unto God, how terrible art thou in thy works. Through the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. All the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to thy name, Selah. Come and see the works of God. He is terrible in his doing toward the children of men. He turned the sea into dry land. They went through the flood on foot. There did we rejoice in him. So again, this is a reference to a, to a positive miracle for the children of Israel. He turned the sea into dry land. He was able, when Moses parted the sea, they, they went across on, on, on dry land. But again, a God with that much power, is, it could be terrifying. It, it, you know, it, it will instill fear in you. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews 12, and we're going to see here. Um, this is healthy to have, by the way, too. It is, it is good to have a healthy fear of the Lord. He is terrible. Now, of course, we should love him, but we also need to fear him. And we're going to get into some of those commandments about fearing God. Because they are important. Even though we're saved. Even though you know, hey, if you're born again, if you're saved, you, you put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will never see hell. That punishment is not for you. You will never go there. But we still need to fear him. And, and you think about, I, I, you know, I use this analogy probably almost every single sermon. You guys are probably getting sick of hearing about it. But when I talk about God, our Father, when you're saved, God is your Father. And, and it's such a great example. You think about, you know, being a, a father to your own child. I think about that with my children, right? Being a father, I want them to love me. I, they, 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 you know, I, I do nice things for them. I bless them. But they do also need to fear me. And... The reason why is because I have rules for them and they need to be able to fear the punishment that, that's going to happen when they break those rules. And, and it's, it's not that they're bad rules. They're for their own good. They're for their benefit. But without that proper fear and respect, and it's not just respect. There is, a, there is fear to that too. It, it's, they go hand in hand, but they, they need to be able to, to be afraid. If nothing else, I want them to be afraid of, of, of doing something really bad just for fear of getting a spanking, you know, because that's going to keep them from doing a lot of really bad things. And I want them to grow up right. And, and God's the same way. We love him. You know, I mean, my children love me. 
They, they don't, they're not afraid of me in the sense that like they think I'm going to kill them or they think I'm going to like torture them or something, you know, like they don't have that type of fear. And we don't, again, we know we're not going to hell. We don't have to have that fear of God that he's just going to cast us into hell. But God does, God says he, he scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Every son he has. I mean, we're not perfect. We mess up just like my kids mess up and they get disciplined. Well, as God's children, when we mess up, he's going to discipline us too. I mean, he's, he's merciful and long-suffering, but, you know, we, we continue in sin. He's going he's gonna to give us the spanking that we need. And we ought to fear that. And, and it's a healthy fear to have because it will help keep us doing the right thing. And that's, that's the point. But you're in Hebrews 12. Jump down to verse number 20 of Hebrews 12. Verse 20 reads, For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. This is obviously talking about when Moses went up into the mountain and he received the Ten Commandments from God. He was with God 40 days and 40 nights. And he said, look, okay, we can't even have an animal or beast, human. No one could come close to the, to the base of that mountain or else it needs to be put to death. It was a holy place. Only Moses was allowed to go up there. And think about Moses now. Moses was a righteous man. He was a godly man. He was humble. He was meek. Now, I mean, he's a sinner. Just like, you know, we're all sinners. But Moses was a great man. One of the, probably one of the greatest men to ever live in the history of, of the earth. I mean, he was really a really great man, a great hero of the faith, someone to look up to. But even Moses, even someone who was doing right, you know, living really well according to God's rules and his commandments and being used so mightily of God, when he was in the presence of God, he was terrified. Mm -hmm. Terrified. And he was a righteous man. I mean, you could think of, if you could think of anyone well, you shouldn't have anything to worry about, right? I mean, he was doing all these good things. He was being used of God. He had already led the children of Israel out. You know, he had done so many great things. He shouldn't have to be afraid, but, you know, he was. In the presence of that, that all-powerful and almighty God, he says, so terrible was the sight. He said, I exceedingly feared and quaked. I mean, he was shaken. And... Because we don't have this experience that Moses had, we don't like commune with God like Moses did, like a friend does face to face. I mean, Moses was very special in that respect. We don't want to lose sight of this. We don't, the concern is that we focus so much on God's love and, and, and on his compassion, long suffering, mercy, that we start to treat him as just a buddy. Right? And I love my children to death. I hope I'm very long-suffering and merciful with them. But I'm not their buddy. I am their father. And God is, I mean, he loves you immensely. He has long-suffering. He has compassion and all these things. But he's not your buddy. He's, he's your father. And we're his children. And, and we need to have that health. And just, just understand that. And... The reason why it's so dangerous is that we could start getting into sin and just start thinking it's not that big of a deal. It's not a problem. Yeah, God's, he's not, you know, he'll look the other way. And we can start to get this, this type of an attitude of us thinking like, oh, God will look past it. He knows I'm not perfect. It's okay. And we kind of just brush things off. Well, we shouldn't. We, we should look at all of our sins as a big deal. God says that even, even telling a lie is enough to send someone to hell. It's a big deal. And, and as I mentioned this morning, you know, when Jesus was on that cross, he had every single one of your sins, not just the big ones. He had the big ones, the little ones, and everything in between. All of those sins were on him. And you think about the suffering that he went through that he didn't deserve. And then you commit a sin and you think it's not a big deal. Jesus suffered and bled and died for that particular sin that you just did. And you're just saying it's not a big deal? Mm -hmm. Ask Jesus if it was a big deal. I guarantee you he would say it was. It's all having the proper mindset. We, we need to understand that you know, we need to live righteously. Now look, we know we're freed from the law. We, we know that we're not going to have that punishment. But the law is still there. 
God still wants us to listen to him. He still wants us to obey him. It's not just like there are zero laws in God's mind and he's like, like sin doesn't even exist anymore. The Bible says sin is the transgression of the law. If there was no law whatsoever, then there would be no sin because sin by definition is the transgression of the law. It's still there. Now, again, it's, we're not going to face the curse of the law if you're saved, but God still wants us to live separated, righteous, and holy lives for a reason. And he wants us to respect him. He wants us to obey him. And, and if we have that proper mindset and, and remember that, that he is a, a terrible God, he, he, he's a very powerful God, and, and just kind of don't lose sight of that, it could help us to, in, in our life to, to, get, to get right with God and to, to do that which is right. Now, um, turn if you would to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You're in Hebrews 12. Just a, just a few, few pages back towards the, the front of the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 5. And you see how many times the word, you know, God being terrible and, and, and having terror, it comes up in the Bible quite a bit. And like I said, I'd, I'd read that before and it kind of strikes you because you think of like terrible, like, oh man, that's bad. You know, like, well, but God's not bad, so how is he terrible, you know? And, and it's just understanding the proper definition of that word terrible. And, and actually, we kind of don't really use it appropriately today. You know, we, we overuse the word. We overuse, I know I do all the time. I say, oh man, that's terrible. It's not really terrible. I mean, it's bad, but it's not that extreme. And we have a tendency to kind of throw words around. Um, but biblically, it's using the word correctly here. But the Second Corinthians 5, let's look at verse number 6. The Bible says, and this is talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6 says, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. So, judgment seat of Christ is something that's going to happen after, we're, after the rapture. We're going we're to stand before Christ, and he's going to reward us for what we've done in our life. Um, the Bible says elsewhere that... that you know, our works are going to be burned up and, and the, that which remains will receive. The, the gold, silver, and precious stones will abide the fire. Those things last. They don't get burned up. The wood, hay, the stubble, that's just going to get burned away. And, and those works that you did were just meaningless, didn't have eternal value. They're going to be gone. But anything that you did for God that was of eternal value, that was, that was precious in His sight, hey, you're going to receive a reward for that. And that's good too. I mean, that's, that's a good motivation for us as children of God to do righteousness, to do, to do good by God, to do the things that He commanded us because, hey, we could lay up treasures for ourselves in heaven. I mean, amen that we're saving and going to heaven as it is, but not only are we going to heaven, we can, we can earn rewards that are going to last us eternity. Way better than anything you could spend your time investing on here or money to, to gather toys and money and boats and cars and all these other things. Hey, that stuff's all going to be burned up. That stuff is not going to last. You're not going to be driving your Ferrari in heaven. I'm sorry. I hate to break the news to you. But, and if you spend all of your time doing that, yeah, you may be saved. You're going you're gonna to go to heaven. Hey, that's, that's great. You know, obviously, it's way better than the alternative. But... What are you spending your time on? Do you, do you want just to have that fun of 10 years or whatever you have with, with that type of a toy and then it's gone for an eternity and, and you never really invested time in laying up these types of treasures? These treasures are going to last in eternity and, and that's, that's the good news. But what we, what we see here though is that we are going to stand before Christ and he's going to judge our works and what they're saying here is that we know the terror of the Lord. Like just, just even standing in front of God there's a terror involved in that, as we saw Moses had. So we persuade men that because we know God's terrible, hey, we ought to be doing as much as possible. That's why I said, whether present or absent from him, we may be accepted of him. He's not talking about being accepted as just being saved. He's talking about being like pleasing in his sight. So when we get there, he can say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. 
We want God to commend us and say, hey, I'm really pleased with you. The same way a father with, with a son who's, who's helping him out and doing good things and, and listening to him, bam, you'd be really pleased with that son, with that child of yours that's, that, that's following those ways and is following after you and doing these things and, um, and helping you out. You want to have that type of acceptance as opposed to the, yeah, I know you told me to do all this stuff, but I don't really want to do it. You know, like the prodigal son that, that just went off and wasted his inheritance and, and did all this stuff. And he came back. Yeah, he still had a spot in his father's home because he was a son. He was, he was still saved, so to speak. I mean, he was, he was still a son of his father's. But because he lived the riotous life and went out and got drunk and partied and, and had women and did all this stuff, he has wasted his substance. He, he, he made it because he was a son, because he was saved, but, but he had nothing left over from that. And we are going to stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ. So you know, that's why he says, we know the terror of the Lord. We need to persuade men. Because how would you like to feel just standing in front of God and there's all your works just go, Phew. and you know you're going to be there for an eternity. You're like, how are you going to feel? I mean, it, sorry, God. I really blew it. I didn't do anything for you. Mm -hmm. I didn't do anything. Thanks for the free gift, though, by the way. You know, I mean, that's, and you're standing before an all-powerful God. That's why we persuade men. I mean, I don't want anyone to be in that situation. Hopefully we're not. Hopefully God could look at us and say, you know what? I appreciate the work that you did for me. That's good. I want to be accepted of it. I want God to look at me. And yeah, I, look, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm not perfect. But I still want to be, I want him to be able to, 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 to look at me and, and be pleased and say, okay, you know, even though, like I look at my kids. I know they're not perfect, but I, I want to be pleased with them. I want them to, do, to be doing good things and doing right things so I can look at them and say, you know, even though you're not perfect, I, I, I really love you and I appreciate the fact that you're doing all these things for me. Um, so that's, that's all the verses we're going to look at for as far as the terror of the Lord. Now we're going to look at fearing God. And we're almost done tonight. I've got a few more points to make, but let's go turn, if you would, to Psalm, Psalm 89. We spend a little bit more time that way. I'm going to read from you from Ecclesiastes 12. It's at the very end of the book of Ecclesiastes. You know, Solomon goes through this whole list from the preacher and he, and he talks about vanity and all this, all the work and the labor that he did and, and how all this stuff, all the works of the flesh and all the works that we can do in this life basically is just, is just vanity. It just, just turns out to be nothing. All, the, all the, these, these other things you could spend your time doing. And he gets to the whole conclusion of the whole book. And in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, he says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Which is exactly what we're talking about, being before the judgment seat of Christ. Our works are going to be tried. And he says, look, this is your whole duty. Just fear God and keep his commandments. That's what we should do. We just fe fear him and listen to him and obey him. That's... That's, that's our jobs here. Um, you're in Psalm, are you in Psalm 89? Look at verse number 7, Psalm 89, verse 7. The Bible reads, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints. And this is, this is in church. It's not, it's, he's not just saying God is to be feared by the heathen because he's going to send them to hell. He says, no, God is to be feared in the assembly of the saints. We are in the assembly of the saints. Today. We're gathered together. We're congregated in the assembly of saints. And to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. We ought, we ought to have a healthy fear of God. Psalm, turn your word to Psalm 96. Psalm 96, verse number 4. The Bible reads, For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. God is to be feared. Uh, flip over to Proverbs. We're gonna, I'm going to kind of blow through some, some verses about the fear of the Lord in Proverbs, and we're going to move on to our next point. But in uh, Deuteronomy 6.13, the Bible says, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, and serve him, and shalt swear by his name. That's a thou shalt, right? That's a commandment. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God. This is something we need to do. Uh, Proverbs 1. Proverbs chapter 1. Look at verse number 7. All these verses. Now, Proverbs has a lot of verses about the fear of the Lord. And we're going to see some different um, knowledge about the fear of the Lord and, and why it's important to fear God. There's, there's many reasons. The Bible says, Proverbs 1-7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, 
but fools despise wisdom and instruction. said, just having a fear of the Lord, that's the beginning. You don't have to understand all of God's commandments. You don't have to understand why things are the way they are. But if you could just first get that proper fear of the Lord to say, like, well, I'm just not going to do it because God said so. I don't have to understand all the reasons why. My girls don't have to understand all of the reasons why I make up the rules that I do for them. They don't. They, they, they don't. They, they're not, they don't know enough yet. When they get older, they will be able to look back and understand and say, oh, well, that's why God, why, God, no, Dad did that. And in relation, we can, you know, as we grow in our faith, as we grow and learn more from the Bible, we could start to understand, oh, that's why God has these rules for me. But the, the beginning of knowledge, just starting out to learn, hey, that's the fear of the Lord, you should be able to, be able to look at the Bible and say, you know what, I'm just going to listen to this because God said so. Whether I understand it or not, that's your, your, your starting point to learning about God and to, and to getting real knowledge and not being a fool who despises wisdom and instruction. Look at verse 29 of Proverbs 1. The Bible says, For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Uh, Proverbs chapter 2, look at verse number 5. Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So having a fear of the Lord is, is something that's going to help you get knowledge. Again, as these other verses is stated. Flip over to Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. We ought not to have a soft spot in our hearts for, for evil, for, for pride, for arrogancy, for the evil way. These things, we need to hate those things. It's not enough just to not necessarily do them. You need to hate them to, to keep them far away from you. The evil way, we, you know, that should be hated from you and that's that. It says that's what the fear of the Lord is. Uh, flip over to Proverbs 9 and verse number 10. Proverbs 9, 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Again, talking about our wisdom, talking about knowledge. Proverbs 10, 27. The Bible reads, The fear of the Lord prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. So if, you, if, if we're able to hate the evil, listen to God and obey God with that proper fear of the Lord, it's going to prolong your days. It's going to prolong your, your days. I mean, it's, it, it's good advice. I mean, it's not just advice. I mean, it's commandments. But obviously, you listen to God. God's telling us what's the, what's the best way for you to live. It's going to prolong your days. It, it just makes sense. Um, Proverbs 14, verses 26 and 27. Proverbs 14, 26 and 27 read, And the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Um, I'm just going to read the rest of you. You can follow along if you want. Proverbs 15, 16, I want to get on to the next point. I kind of spent a little bit too much time here. Proverbs 15, 16 says, Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Proverbs 15.33 reads, The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Proverbs 16.6 says, By mercy and truth iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord men depart from evil. Proverbs 19.23, The fear of the Lord tendeth to life, and he that hath it shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. And then Proverbs 22 Proverbs 22.4 reads, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. And then Proverbs 23.17 says, Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. Don't look at the sinners. Don't look at the Hollywood movie stars and actors and actors that are living these adulterous lives, that are living these blaspheming lives, that, that, that live in wickedness. Don't envy that. Don't look at that and say, I wish I had what they have. I wish I had all this money and, and all this fame and, and, and was able to be so popular by being in these movies where they're doing wicked things and living out adulterous lives. He says, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. Don't worry about what the sinner's doing. Just, just fear God. God says these things are wicked. We need to stay away from that. Next attribute. We got, I, I kind of wanted to spend the most on that, the terrible and the fear of God. There's a couple other attributes, though, that we can look at when we read the Bible and... Again, it's, it, part of it is the usage of our terms today. And part of it is just people just not quite understanding all the attributes of God. For instance, flip back, if you would, to Exodus chapter 20. 
we're going to see here that God is jealous. Now, these days you hear people, you know, women saying, like, I don't want my, I don't want my husband to be so jealous and all this other stuff. Actually, depending on how you're using that term, jealousy isn't a bad thing. God himself is jealous. And when we look at these verses, we're going to see, how is God jealous? He doesn't want you going to other gods. And that's the way that it's used. He said, I don't want you going to other gods. I'm a jealous God. I want you serving me. I want you loving me. I want to have your affection and your attention. Just as I think it's very righteous for a husband or for a wife to say, hey, I want your affection on me. You're my spouse. You know, you're my wife. I don't want you giving your love and your attention, your affection to some other man. That's righteous. That's a righteous jealousy. I mean, this is how God, this is an attribute of God, and God made us after His own image. But these days, it's such a promiscuous environment that we live in today that people think, oh, it's just not a big deal. And, and then, you know, ladies start having all these different friendships with men, and they start getting in, into, like, really close and intimate relationships, and then we wonder why there's so much adultery. And men doing the same thing, just spending all these times with ladies that are not their wife, and sharing all of these, you know, personal moments and personal experiences, all this stuff. And then we wonder why there's adultery. You wonder why there's fornication. I think some people need to be a little bit more jealous. And just, and just, just keeping that, that relationship devoted with you. Um, Exodus 20, look at verse number 5. We're going to see some of these, these attributes of the jealousy of God being a jealous God. Which is why I'm even making this point. Exodus 20, verse number 5, he says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, talking about false gods, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So right here, when he's going through the Ten Commandments, obviously the first two are not creating an image and not bowing down to the image. Those are, those are commandments one and two. And the reason for that, that God gives right here in verse five, is because I'm a jealous God. I don't want you bowing down to some other God. You need to be bowing down to me and serving me. Exodus 34. Flip over to Exodus 34. Exodus 34, verse 14 says, For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is jealous, is a jealous God. That's a pretty strong statement. I mean, he's saying like, like my name is jealous. Mm -hmm. Not only am I a jealous God, like that's my name. Like I'm jealous, okay? You, you want to call it, you, people use a joke, you're like, look up, um, you know, people, some people say like, look up stupid dictionaries, there's going to be a picture of Pastor Burson's or something, you know, but <laughs> God's like, okay, look up the name jealous. Yeah, that's me. Like, like that's my name. I'm jealous. I'm a jealous God. And that's, and that's what he's saying here. He's like, my name is Jealous. And he's serious about that. He, he, doesn't, want, he doesn't want us going after, because it makes him angry. Think about all the time when God gets really angry, especially in the Old Testament. You read about the children of Israel, they start worshiping strange gods. They start going at, they go to the high places, they, they make the groves, and they start worshiping all these false gods. And what does God do? God gets angry. God gets fire angry. And, and he's like, okay, guess what now? You're going to go into captivity. Because you decided to start worshiping all these false gods and, 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 and everything I told you not to do. Because he's a jealous God. He wants us. You know, and he's done, think about it. He's done so much for us. He, he did so much for the children. He's done so much for us personally. Giving up his own son to die for our sins. And then, you know, for you to turn around and just start worshiping some other god. I don't blame him for being, for being angry about that. And that's why I say it's a same, you know, in a, in a, in a relationship. You know, it, we are likened as a, as a bride to Christ. And God is a jealous God. He's a, he's a husband. He doesn't want us giving our affections to anyone else. That is clear all throughout the Bible. It should be the same way in a marriage. You know, I don't want my wife, like, like having all these really personal, intimate moments with, with other guys and, like, pouring out her heart to them and stuff like that. Like, that's, that's wicked. That's wrong. That's when, that's when the heart starts to depart from the, from the husband or from the wife when they start getting into these types of relationships. 
And it starts off innocent. Look, I know the way it goes, but, but that's how slick Satan is. He tries, he tries to get his foot in the door and get you to start doing these things. And it starts off as just a real cordial thing. Someone you met at work. Oh, we're going to go out here. We're going we're gonna to go get a cup of coffee. And then you just start growing this friendship and building it before long. I mean, you've got this heart, this relationship going on. It's not going to happen in my family, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> I'm not going to allow my wife to go out and just start palling around and buddying up with these guys and just spending this time alone with them. That's not going to happen. Because I'm a jealous husband. And, and I expect her to be the same exact way. And you know what? She is. <laughs> she is that way. And, and God bless her for it. I love it. I love the fact that she doesn't want me, you know, she... Fortunately, as, as the position where she's able to stay home and take care of the kids here, um, I go to work. And when I go to work, though, I work, there's male and female people there. I mean, it, it's a lot easier for me to get, to get caught up into, into making friends with, with females at work because you're working together. You're there, I'm there for eight to ten hours a day. You know, it's a long time to be in a place. But look, I make it a point, like, I'm not going to be all friendly with, with these other women because they don't deserve my attention and my affection that way my life does. I'm not going to be sharing all these things with them. I mean, they're my coworkers. I get along with them fine. You know, I'm not like, like, you know, like, <laughs> like stay away from me. I can't, I can't look at you. I can't talk to you. I can't like, like work with you. No, I mean, you could be cordial and friendly with people, but I'm not going to be their friend. You know, that's not, we're, we're not going to have that type of a friendship in, in the sense where like we're going to go out and we're going to go out to lunch and we're going to go out and do all these things. I'm, that's, I'm not even going to let it get started that way. But, um, so where we're at, God's a jealous God. Deuteronomy 4, you don't have to turn out. I'm just going to read through some of these because I want to get through this. We're getting a little bit late on time. Deuteronomy 4.24 says, For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Ezekiel 38.19 says, For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. And in um, 2 Corinthians 11.2, the Bible reads, For I am jealous over you, with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So he's talking about here having a godly jealousy, which is exactly what I've just been trying to explain, this godly jealousy. God is a jealous God. You know, I know today people kind of tend to take that word and mean it to be like, well, you're real possessive and controlling and all of these other things. It's not really the same thing exactly. I mean, there's, there's some of those things maybe tend to follow the jealousy, but like the jealousy itself of, of, of desiring your wife and, and, or your husband to, to, to be solely unto you and, and to not have any, any type of relationship with the opposite gender, um, there's nothing wrong with that. And we see that from the Bible. God actually has this attribute. And the last one I want to talk about is um, God's hateful side. And again, this is something that, you know, it might shock you, maybe you've heard that before, but it only makes sense. God, God is a complete God. God is the one. He created heaven, and, and His mercies are abundant, and, and He loves us tremendously. But He did also create hell. And <laughs> by no stretch of the imagination is, is hell is a, is a good place. You listen to a sermon I preach about hell. It's, it is... It is the worst place you could ever imagine being. It's, it's, I mean, just being engulfed in flames and in darkness and just hearing weeping and wailing and crying and people tortured and tormented. That is not a place for people that God loves. I'm sorry. God is very loving, but that is not, that is not, and this is, this is the argument though. This is the argument that the Jehovah's Witnesses will use. And they'll say, because I've talked to them and they'll say like, well, I don't believe that a loving God would put people, send people to hell to be tortured. And then people will say that, but it's because they, have this, they don't have a complete view of God. Mm -hmm. They think that He is only love, and that's not true. I'll tell you, it's a lie. Yes. Now look, God is love, and I can't, I, you really can't say that enough because, because He is so merciful. He is so long-suffering, but that is not all He is. He, he has wrath. He has anger. The Bible says that the Lord is angry with the wicked every day. And, and God has hate, and I'm going to prove that to you. The Bible says in, um, turn if you would, oh, we'll, get, we'll get to, so, we'll end it in Psalms. So turn if you would to Psalm 11. I'll, I'll just going to read a couple of places for you. 
In Hosea 9.15, the Bible says, All their wickedness is in Gilgal, for there I hated them. For the wickedness of their doings, I will drive them out of mine house. And just so you know that hate means hate, he says, I will love them no more. All their princes are revolters. That was in um, Hosea 9.15. And now I'm going to read for me from Malachi chapter 1. Malachi 1, 2 says, I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Now, just to be clear what this is talking about, that's talking about like a whole, a whole nation. It's not talking about like the individual Esau, like, like that he hated him personally. Not that God doesn't hate individuals, but in this just... In the context here of Malachi 1, when he talks about he loved Jacob, he hated Esau, he's talking about, the, he goes on in context of that chapter talking about the, the cursings of the nation that they had. But um, this is just to point out verses that don't, may, maybe they don't often get preached because they're not, I mean, it's not fun talking about God's hatred or God's jealousy or God's anger or, you know, like it's not... You know, like I said, it's not, this isn't something that's going to like, you're going to be walking out of here like, man, I'm in such a great mood because of, <laughs> because of God's anger, you know. But, uh, but we, it's, it is important to understand these things, and hopefully it'll help you. Hopefully it'll help you just, just to get a full picture. Like, we understand this is who God is. This is who the Bible says that God is. We want to understand more about him. Psalm 11, look at verse number 5. The Bible says, The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked, and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Now, Again, there's, there's kind of this false doctrine going around and people say like, um, hate the sin, love the sinner. Now, in a sense that's true, in a sense that's not. But when we're talking about, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to get to that because we don't even have time for that as far as how we should be towards people. We're just looking at God. So, so forget about like, like whether we should hate people or not and all this other stuff. We're just looking at the attributes of God tonight. Because okay? I'm not, I'm not even going to start touching that subject. I don't have enough time to really go into depth into that. But here we see... In Psalm 11, 5, it says, But the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hates. This is talking about a person, him that loveth violence. God's soul hates them. And I don't know about you, I don't want to be hated by God. You know, I, would hate to have, I would hate to have that said about me, that God hates me. And then um, turn, if you would, just back to Psalm chapter 5. This is the last verse we're going to turn to. I promise we're done after this. Psalm chapter 5. Because we're going to see basically the same exact thing. Psalm 5, verse 5. The Bible reads, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. Abhor is even a stronger word for hate. And he says he will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. Not just the things that they did. He's going to hate the bloody and deceitful man. Which is why people are sent to hell because he doesn't he doesn't love them when they become his child when they become his son when they just receive that free gift and they're born into God's family he loves all of his children but not everybody is a child of God there is there are people that that are hated and, and God's wrath is what kindles the the fires of hell and obviously we love people which is why we go out and try to warn them about this but we need to just have a proper view of God just, just to get this full understanding of who He is. You know, there, there are some what we would consider negative attributes. God's terrible. He instills terror. He, he is someone to be feared. God's jealous. And there, there is hatred that comes from God. Now, are those, are those attributes just like overwhelming that this is who God is? Just overwhelming like this is all about Him? No, it's not. And that's why we don't, you know, I try not to focus on these things too much. But obviously, we went through a lot of scripture tonight. And we turned to a lot of places. It is, it is found in the Bible. I'm not just making this stuff up. These are attributes of God. They're in the Bible. We're going to learn, try to learn as much as we can about him. Just for one, to know him. I mean, we want to know who God is, right? I mean, I know I do. I want, I want to get closer to God. I want to learn as much about him as I can. I love him. And I want to be as pleasing in his sight as possible. I, I don't want to be... Someone who, um, where all my, all my works are going to be burned up. Where God looks at me and he's just like, you did nothing. I mean, praise the Lord. Like, if, if you're saved and you're going to go to heaven, amen. That's great news. 
But let's not stop there. If you're saved, let's, let's keep moving forward. Let, let's try to do what God really wants us to do. Let's warn others. Let's love others enough to, to tell them about God. I mean, someone who's, who's, just gonna, who, who's not willing to tell you the truth about God doesn't really love you. Someone who's not willing to tell you that hell's a real place, if you're not willing to tell that to another person and say, hey, if you don't believe on Jesus Christ, your soul, will, you're going to end up in hell. Because, my friend, that's the truth. And if you're not willing to tell that to someone, you don't really love that person. You don't. Because you're withholding from them. And, and oftentimes, we, we're, again, we get this stupid, satanic culture. People say, well, you can't talk about religion. That's taboo. And they want to make you afraid to talk about these things because, oh, God forbid, you might offend somebody. I'll tell you what. I offend people almost, probably almost every time I go out and knock on doors and talk to people. Now, is that my goal? Is that my intention? Like, man, I want to see how many people I can offend tonight. Of course not. Of course it isn't. But it happens. And I'm not going to just withhold the gospel and withhold preaching about Jesus and withhold preaching about hell because I'm worried that maybe someone might get offended. Because for every person that gets offended, there's someone else who's willing to listen and put their faith on Jesus Christ and get saved. You can't worry about those that are going to get offended. Hey, if they're going to get offended, they're going to get offended anyways. But at least you can say, I tried. I, I loved you enough to tell you the truth. You could hate me for that. You could never speak to me again for that. But you know that you did it out of love. And, and we all ought to remember that and, and to have that love for others to be able to, to tell people the truth about God. That's, that's just, it's found in these pages. You know, we don't have to make anything up about God because it sounds good. It is what it is. And that's, you know, that's why we're, we're Word of Truth Baptist Church. We're interested in just knowing the truth from God's Word. That's, that's what we care about here. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for, for these great words that you've given us. God, help us to just continue to grow closer to you and, and to learn more about you, dear God. Um, it, it is important for us to know these, at, these attributes that you have, that we, we can maintain a proper respect and a proper fear for you, dear God. Um, I, it, it might be a little bit too easy for us sometimes to be able to, to, to blow off our sins and to just think they're not a big deal. But we know what Jesus went through for us and, and for those sins specifically that we've done. God, help us never to have that type of a flippant attitude. Help us to just, to just get right and, and to do that's good. I know we're not going to be perfect, dear God, but, but I pray that you would please help us to be as close to perfect as we possibly can and to just learn more about you, God. Grant us wisdom and understanding, dear Lords. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.